We are back with more licensed games. The two I have for you today are rather interesting. One was bottom of the barrel bad enough to dissuade my enthusiasm for the game series back in the day, and the other was a genuine surprise for not being more of the same. I didn't even know I wanted to do the Order of the Phoenix game until I saw it and realized it was only natural to put it on the same stage as the Goblet of Fire game, just to further shame Goth. Goblet of Fire. I think the menu really says it all. No, they did not animate the food to stare at you. Those are sprites being passed off as 3D models. In 2005. I mean, it's almost a cool main menu with a dynamic 3D render of the Great Hall. It's just a couple models away from being good. Far better than the Order of the Phoenix menu though, for sure. There is a lot to unpack with this game, so let's just jump right in. If you're familiar with my past video, or even just the games up to this point, then a couple things are going to immediately stand out. Chief among them, of course, is the switch up from third person to isometric perspectives. This is universal, because it was decided that the franchise needs to enter the modern age and not have five or six different versions for all the different systems. Except Nintendo DS, of course. Instead, a single version was made and then ported to the other systems, by the company that made Chamber of Secrets for the GameCube, Xbox, and PS2, Electronic Arts UK. This is not just an EA double feature. Some of the developers who worked at EA UK joined Criterion, who went on to do the space battles in Battlefront 2017. Goblet of Fire has switched from an open-world, third-person adventure game format to a linear, isometric action game. And when I say linear, I mean the hub world of Hogwarts has been replaced with a level select screen. But it does have co-op now. Someone looked at Prisoner having the whole trio be playable and decided that couch co-op was the move, even if it meant sacrificing the open world. Hey, Private Sessions, it's your turn to collaborate with me. All right, sounds good. Uh, we're doing Fault 76 though, right? Well, I didn't try the co-op, but judging by what happens in the game, I can conclude it wouldn't even really change much. See, the advantage of co-op is that you can have two players accomplishing two separate tasks at the same time. But in this mode, everyone is chained to the same general area of the level, and there are so few interaction opportunities that most people would just be the second and third wheel watching as one person does the one interactable thing. And the game is not buggy enough to advertise itself as being fun in an ironic way. I suppose there is the novelty of the competitive progression. The Birdie Bot's beans are now used for unlocking cards that augment things like Jinx power, health, and increasing the length of a superpower magic mode. So, in theory, players are competing to unlock these cards. I love that the cards just have screen caps of the movie on them. Some of these are wonderful memories. <laughs> or not even related to the character who has the card. It's just beautifully lazy to go from having unique illustrations of the wizard cards to screenshots. Okay, so problems. The cards are unlocked through long-term progression, so even if you got good at stealing all the beans from your friends, you would just end up with a ton of beans in the bank and nothing to spend them on because you haven't gotten far enough as a group yet. And then you have to consider that you want the group to progress together. The progression just pushes you to level up your Jinx power in order to shorten the length of the combat sections, and, and most anything else is superfluous. You can only have three cards active assigned in this menu. This menu reminds me of Bioshock a lot, which made me curious what the common ancestor was. Theory's World War II games. I also hate the music that plays in this menu. Harry, I protest! Harry, you put your name in the cupboard of fire! Dumbledore asked calmly. There is an auto card function, and I have no idea how it's actually prioritizing the cards to recommend these bizarre builds, other than a random number generator. Playing solo, you have to instead manage the progression of all three characters. Which is great, it means switching between the cast. But there isn't much distinction, especially as time goes on. And I mean, it's a game called Harry Potter, and this is based on the film, so Ron gets treated like a bumbling dipshit quite a bit that Hermione has to put into place. Bertie Boss Beans! Ron, that is not the appropriate response. Also, 14 is a little old to be chasing candy around. And I guess someone agreed because the beans got replaced with generic magical aura in Order of the Phoenix. 15. Too old for beans, old enough to become a libertarian guy. Gameplay wise, it's um... It's just kinda there. I was worried about the lack of mouse inversion listed on the PC gaming wiki, until I realized that there is no mouse control in this game. Movements handled with the arrow keys and spells are done with the Z, X, and C keys. 
Z is always Axio, which summons beams towards you. Because someone decided it would be more fun if they tried to run away from us now. X is the Jinx key, and C is for environmental spells. It's all contextual, though. Which Jinx you cast depends on the situation, so there are more spells, but it's a semantic distinction. Environmental spells are contextual as well. Levitation's back being used in a mix of combat, but occasionally to move objects around, which do have havoc physics. Carpe Retractum from Prisoner returns, but instead of using it to get around the level, you use it to open gates, lower bridges, and fling these things. I hate Carpe Retractum because it really just slows the game down to hold the spell, try to drag an object, wait for someone to help me out, etc. Okay, you use the spell to open a gate. By the time you've committed to that action, you've already solved the problem mentally, so you're just waiting for the game to be on the same page about that. At least with levitation, flinging things around with Havoc Physics is fun. I'm just slowly waiting for help opening a door. It's the same function that Elohomora provided in the previous games, just made more tedious for no reason. Herbivicus is an interesting one. All it does is open up various areas for exploration. So you'll see the areas earlier in the game and then later can replay the level once you have the spell. And you'll be replaying levels quite a bit. In order to pad out the runtime, level progression requires the collection of these shields. Hogwarts Exterior, for instance, immediately starts with an intersection that itself branches multiple times later in the level. That makes some levels surprisingly big, given how cheap this game is, but the issue is that you can't get everything in one go. Not just because of Herbivicus, but because someone decided that if you pick up one of the big shields, that instantly ends the level. This part of the Forbidden Forest in particular stands out. There are two big shields in sight and one smaller shield. The big shields will end the level, which means twice I need to run all the way here, including past all of the obstacles, enemies, carpe retractum sections, just to get both shields. That's extra padding on top of requiring these things in the first place. Shields are also awarded for completing various collectible objectives. For instance, the Forbidden Forest has 10 of these smaller shields. And when you get them all, instead of just increasing the amount you have, it actually just creates a new big shield by the spawn point. It doesn't tell you this, you just have to load back into the level and see that there's a big shield there now. There is some leeway, you don't have to get every shield in every level to complete the game, but it is close, and certainly a way of artificially increasing the runtime, or at least getting people to fully play out the levels, which I will admit, surprised me for not just being linear challenge corridors. They just weren't particularly interesting, especially when certain tedious sequences have to be completed multiple times just because I want to unlock the next leg of the adventure. Also, worth noting, half of the levels will crash the game if you're playing at a resolution above 1080p. You can play at pretty much any resolution, I got it working at 1440p in about 10 minutes, but that comes with using a hex editor. There's changing INI file values, and then there's hacking the game to actually run at a good resolution and I used NVIDIA Control Panel to get anti-aliasing. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that's how you do it. It's, it's weird that you thought I was bragging. I would be willing to bet the levels which crash at higher resolutions are due to some texture being unable to scale that high, so I had to resolve that by having multiple executable files to switch between 1080 and 1440 whenever I wanted to play the busted levels, which was around half of them. That's not ideal, but hey, it was 2005 who could have predicted resolutions above 800 by 600. But yeah, let's just say I was suspicious at how quickly I was able to get this game running without a hitch. Then again, apparently I'm really lucky when it comes to bugs after I watched some videos by Grayfruit which showcased the prior games I played being far glitchier than I ever experienced, both back in the day and on modern Windows. But is this a game actually worth playing? No, welcome to Herbology class, or Wizarding Nom. This is where the central gameplay idea of infinitely throwing annoying enemies at the player while asking them to spend a couple seconds casting an interruptible spell to advance really just takes off. That's all Herbivicus is, a timer where you pray you don't get hit while casting. That could justify the co-op, having one player dedicated to advancing the levels while the others fight the enemies but it's not consistent enough to really justify bringing other kids over to play it. Is this a kid's game, or is it for teenagers? The gang is supposed to be 14 years old at this point, so this should be a more mature game, and it is. The Peggy rating went up from 3 to 7, as in years old. 
That's probably why they don't show Cedric getting killed on screen, or that time a Death Eater disguised as a wizard cop taught a kid whose parents were tortured into insanity the finer points of how that curse works. Well, that's in the scope of how much of the story is even in the game. I imagine this just came down to a money thing. Increasing the age of the audience has to happen inevitably, but maybe we can milk the younger audience for a while longer. The games were never perfect recreations of the story, definitely just supplemental material for either the films or the books themselves, but this game would definitely leave your head scratching the most if you knew nothing else about the series up to this point. There are lots of unaddressed plot points because the entire Barty Crouch thing is not addressed. If you went into Order of the Phoenix having only played Goblet, you might be confused why Umbridge took over Moody's position. Maybe that's marketing, they don't want to give away the end twist of the film. That would require you to forget that the book had already been out for five years. And I think that touches on the real identity crisis of this game. It lacks any distinct vision and so defaults into this state. The puberty of game design. If I had to guess, the decision to switch to linear level selection over a hub castle area might have been motivated by the scope of the Triwizard Tournament. Three challenges, one of which requires flying and another being a water level. What is funny is that the Triwizard challenges that are central to the plot of Goblet are non-cooperative levels, not even really levels but more set pieces that are just anchoring the game down. When you're so cheap you resort to reusing the casual outfits of the cast from the very beginning instead of giving them actual school uniforms, you can figure an open area was out of the cards. Which was criticized at the time and resulted in Order of the Phoenix switching to a more familiar open world design. Which actually shocked me. I had been so disappointed by Goblet of Fire, I gave up on the games entirely, and the review scores for Phoenix being worse than Goblet of Fire just kind of affirmed that it must have been more of the same. By the time I saw the games on YouTube, the Deathly Hallow games had been out, which just looked like more of Goblet. But I think the reality is that the standards changed in, oh, 2007. And that must have been a common sentiment because they tried renaming the company to EA Brightlight in 2008, but then shut down in 2011 after Deathly Hallows Part 2 was released. Mind you, this was the company that was supposed to be making the new Dungeon Keeper and Syndicate games after acquiring Bullfrog. I'm horny. Instead, EA just shuffled the IP off and consigned Brightlight to Death by Shovelware. It's really fun how things come together on this channel. I mean, it's not fun. I'm sure for the dozens of employees who had to move to other cities after Brightlight got split up into EA subsidiaries, it would have been an unfun time. Order of the Phoenix was the last game that Brightlight did under the EA UK moniker. I mean, other than porting the orange box to PlayStation 3. And it is quite the reversal from Goblet of Fire. It keeps the isometric perspective idea, but completely changes the level and game design to better match the earlier titles. Hogwarts has been fully realized into a continuous playable area. The problem is that given the claustrophobic nature of some areas and the fact that the camera is out of the player's control, it does lead to some messiness. This game could have gone up a full point just by having a third person camera and it's not like it couldn't. These are fully rendered areas which you can see with the discovery camera and you aren't going to see the backs of trees that are unwrapped like you already can in Goblet. But even with the foibles of the camera, the scope of what the game is trying to accomplish is impressive. The basic premise of the game is that Harry Potter is trying to form a group called Dumbledore's Army and you need to go out and gather all 28 members. This is in addition to our classes and other objectives, all of which are spread throughout the castle. This section is the bulk of the game's content and where it's fairly strong. So much so in fact that most of the occasions where movie plot points butt in almost entirely serve to bring the game down. As an example, the Patronus is used twice in the game. The first time against Dementors, and the second time in a class, which is both backwards and pointless as the spell is not useful in the game, yet we need to have both moments because they're necessary for the plot of the movie. Another weird thing was when Trelawney got fired. They opted to do this as a cutscene that you overhear instead of the big dramatic moment that it is in the movie, and I figured that was just because they didn't want to make a model for Trelawney, but then later we see that there was a model for Trelawney, so... It was self-defense! Yeah, and that thing with the Dementors was messed up as well. I wonder how that joke's gonna get perceived. In spite of that, Order of the Phoenix was in its prime longer than Goblet of Fire padded out its runtime. 
I'd say it's the lack of a strict adherence to the plot, in favor of telling a much smaller scale story within the confines of Hogwarts, that helps this game to punch above its weight. Quests are not individually strong, but it's that element of doing some environmental thing that happens to please a shortcut portrait while on my way to do a different task that really makes this game stand out. A guy in the Transfiguration Courtyard will tell you to look out for talking gargoyles that are spread throughout the castle, and at first I hated this, but I happened to come across all of them while doing other quests. It meant that most parts of the castle kept being relevant places to try to explore, other than some of the distant extremes like the forest and the dock. You don't know where the other talking gargoyles are, do you? I haven't seen another gargoyle since the one on that plinth disappeared. What happened to him? About a year ago, some boy flew through here being chased by a dragon. It knocked my friend right over the edge. Uh... Come back and talk to me sometime, won't you? I mean, it wouldn't even be the first time Harry's killed, so... Things start to wear thin as you run down the number of DA members, until eventually you get to the last few quests. At this point, the portraits went on strike and refused to work as shortcuts. The shortcuts were good for easing the confusing nature of the castle, but one of the quests to unlock a shortcut that goes to a genuinely worthless area involved talking to the other portraits, and they would refuse to work as shortcuts until I fully completed the quest. What caught me up was a deceptive piece of advice to look for a shepherdess on the second floor, which was a generic looking painting in a generic frame I had passed a thousand times that was in the charms area, not the second floor. And the marauder's map, which will give you a trail to follow to get to places around the castle, does not account for the shortcuts that are refusing to work while you do the quest. Also, the castle is very generic and repetitive in terms of aesthetics, meaning that only a couple areas carry enough distinction for me to actually remember them. It is a very confusing mess, which may be intentional given the setting, but it made trying to navigate the castle while my map was being useless an actual nightmare, especially since I was looking for a non-standard painting in an area where it does not exist. The Grand Staircase area was also a mixed bag, because again, the stairs are intentionally inconvenient as per the setting. There seems to be some intelligence in trying to predict where they need to be, but you're going to be guaranteed to be stuck waiting for a staircase to float over back to you. And unlike Chamber of Secrets, you aren't allowed to just jump the stairs and try to land on the lower levels. Also, there is a dynamic animation for using the railing. Seriously, this is the same company that was using sprites instead of 3D models last game. This has to be one of the most accomplished worlds I've seen in a licensed shovelware game in this era. The continuous playable space was available, regardless of which console you played it on, even on the back-ported PlayStation 2. That means no loading screens, even in situations where they could get away with it. Now, before you rush off to play this, I have to warn you about some... issues. Order of the Phoenix, for all its strengths, is not as simple to run as Goblet, nor was it the most stable of experiences. They added resolution options, and it's even embraced widescreen, but it only goes up to 1600 by 900. It doesn't crash at 1440p, technically. Yeah, this was one of those cases where I eventually got it working, and once I did, I did not try to touch anything else. Hex editing this time just added black bars to all of the sides of the screen for the extra resolution, instead of actually increasing the scale. Apparently it's a Windows Vista thing, which makes sense considering my experience with games from the Vista era is pretty consistently broken. Some other fun things, if you play on hard difficulty, some of the NPC behavior just breaks. There's a random chance your computer won't be able to load the bridge area, and the only solution is to run the game on a virtual machine if you're one of the unlucky ones, because there's no known fix. One person recommended a fix for a problem by suggesting that people only play on save slot 2. Yeah, really. I think when we're having problems dependent on which save slot you use, things get superstitious quick. Just pray to the Harry Potter shrine, or wait for Hogwarts Legacy to come out. The original adapted games are in licensing limbo between Warner Brothers and Electronic Arts, which fits since Warner Brothers' actions in the last few years could basically be described as goofing off. See, Order of the Phoenix was where EA started selling the games on Origin, so this was technically a digital product, but this is the kind of fate a game has when it's digitally listed, yet gets taken off of storefronts due to licensing issues. Abandonware, just like all the others. It having been digital at one time has not done any favors for people of the future. 
Warner Brothers could come along and decide, if not to remaster, at the very least patch the games to work in the modern era and make them available. Of course, that would come along with preserving these creepy, inexpressive models. I love that the reward for secret hunting, since we got rid of the beans, is to watch clips of a documentary about the making of the game. They were very proud of having face scanned the actors, but uh, I don't know if it's better. Apparently these aired on MTV. Warner Brothers is probably looking at it from the perspective that unless they're going to remaster the games, and that's a lot to ask for, there really is not any point. Plus, the franchise is somewhat in limbo. Rowling's Wizarding World is still a profitable franchise, even after the conclusion of the film series of the original Harry Potter saga. The Cursed Child seemed to perform well, both as a theater production and a script publication. It was only considered a critical failure. And the Fantastic Beasts movie were increasingly unpopular, yet still performed profitably. And yet, Warner Brothers decided that the performance of the third film was going to determine if the five-part series was actually going to get finished. And despite turning a profit, at least in foreign markets, it looks like it won't be. Which leaves Hogwarts Legacy in the mobile game, Hogwarts Mystery, as the last big productions of the franchise. Hogwarts Legacy being in two separate minor controversies prior to launch speaks to the franchise, honestly. Harry Potter is pretty weird. The story of how it came to be and how it immediately blew up and became hyper-commercialized. Then the fans got older, started having distinct political opinions, and Rowling, for her part, started doing that thing authors do where they have lots of spare time and become even weirder and more controversial. And so society has been awkwardly saddled with this franchise that's probably just waiting for its second life when the kids who grew up with it introduce their own spawn to the series. And then we'll get a straight to streaming series of the books on Discovery Plus, if that's still around in even a month from today. Which of course will advertise itself on being even more accurate to the novels in order to cater to the adults, probably far more so than the kids. But until then, it all falls on Hogwarts Legacy, which may actually stand a better chance being independent of any of the films. The worst part of the Order of the Phoenix is, well, the Order of the Phoenix. If the game was just called Dumbledore's Army and cut out all the necessary film tie-ins that rapidly fly through the end of the movie, it would be alright. Not good, but alright. Even the earlier games seemed to work when they weren't following the script, but just coming up with interesting stuff to do. The finale of the game is the hijinks arc where the gang becomes domestic terrorists. But then the game gets really combat heavy, which doesn't work due to just how chaotic and bizarre the spellcasting is. Not that it matters since there's apparently no penalty for losing the fights despite there being difficulty settings. The goal is to try and incorporate a movement-oriented spellcasting system, but something seems off about how it's interpreting mouse inputs, which causes spells to fail frequently. That can be somewhere between annoying and downright infuriating during exploration, but during combat turns into an abject mess. So I think as long as Hogwarts Legacy is doing expressly, not this, it'll probably be better. Also, fun note, Order of the Phoenix is the first game to not feature any kind of extensive flying, it does have extremely long, linear climbing sequences, though. Could probably skip this if we had the ability to levitate- oh, wrong game. Sorry, you just- you get in the habit of calling it out, you know. Oh, wait, there is a flying part. Thank wizard god. Wouldn't want to abandon the tradition of shoving in a worse flying minigame than Harry Potter and the Stone of Synonyms. It's funny, though, because it's the only time in the game where we hop out of Harry's head, and the first time that we play as Fred or George. These guys were absent in Goblet after running a black market back in Prisoner, and it seems things have panned out as they're effectively masterminding the hijinks, more so than Harry is. If building Dumbledore's army is Act 1 and the hijinks arc is Act 2, then there's a great imbalance in these two acts. We get introduced to the majority of the usable spells in the prologue, and what gets introduced in the body of Act 1 is not really used in Act 2. For instance, the invisibility cloak has been added as a mechanic, but other than the one time you're expressly told to use it, you don't use it for anything. There is a really awkward minigame for occlumency, but other than the finale, the multiple times we're required to practice this is unnecessary. And even in terms of amount of content, there's no natural balance between how much setup is involved in getting the DA together versus actually doing things with them afterwards. It makes me think the game didn't get finished, which is a shame. Still, there were the later games, Half-Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows Parts 1 and 2. Given Half-Blood Prince was their last chance to use Hogwarts as a setting, 
it actually looks like it uses the same exact map layout. So maybe the hard decision was made to cut Order of the Phoenix short and take the risk to try and perfect the formula with Half-Blood Prince. But those games aren't for today. Best to leave them for another day. This is hopefully going to come out before the end of the year, so thanks to the patrons for funding my work in 2022.